In addition to convening Nobel laureates, the World Summit annually recognizes a high-profile personality making an outstanding contribution to international social justice and peace. Past recipients of the Summit Peace Award include Annie Lennox, Bono, George Clooney, and Don Cheadle. Please direct your attention to the screens for a short video about this year's award recipient. families fed. There were homes given when all else was taken away. Relief for the sick, hope for the hurt, new life from all that was lost. It took believers, dreamers, doers to save Haiti from its darkest hour. It took faith, fortitude, fearlessness to shine a light bright enough for the world to see. On January 12, 2010, Haiti took its greatest fall and at the same time found its greatest friend, Sean Penn and JPHRO. Only the magnitude of what was wrong inspired him to make it right, bringing order to chaos, hope to the hopeless, remembrance to the forgotten. Hundreds of days of work and struggle have come and gone, but Sean's dedication remains the same, because being a friend is about being there, but also Staying there. The world thought all of Haiti was lost. But what Haiti found was a friend. Please be seated. Excellencies, fellow laureates, students of Chicago and elsewhere in the world, in particular those of you from the Vry Advantage Academy who received me so warmly on Monday, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I feel very honored having been asked to introduce this year's Peace Summit Award recipient who is none other than Sean Penn. Sean, or should I say Ambassador Penn, His Excellency Ambassador Penn, since President Martelli of Haiti bestowed the honor appointing him Ambassador at Large for Haiti in January this year does, of course, not need an introduction to any audience. In fact, he's probably better known around the globe than many Nobel Peace laureates assembled here in Chicago today. <laughs> we are not here today, however, to honor and pay tribute to his many artistic accomplishments. As a global film icon, as an Oscar-winning Best Actor, as a writer, producer, and feature film director, nor for his lesser known exploits as a journalist, but for his extraordinary 
humanitarian work in the aftermath of the earthquake that shook Haiti in January 2010 and that killed nearly a quarter of a million people and made some 1.5 million people homeless and vulnerable. I would also like to pay tribute to my fellow United Nations workers, of whom 102 died and perished in the quake. Sean already had a taste of humanitarian work in New Orleans in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, but his engagement in Haiti within days after the quake struck has demonstrated the highest caliber of humanity, commitment, and determination in the face of adversity. Far from a drive-by celebrity, he actually exchanged his home in Malibu for a tent in a sprawling camp of some 40,000 internally displaced people. Equipped with a can-do attitude, hands-on, rolling up his sleeves, leading by example, a doer, not just a talker, as others have previously commented. He established in the nick of time an organization called JP Haitian Relief Organization, or JPHRO, which has since become a leader in Haiti across multiple sectors working to improve living conditions in the internally displaced person camps and surrounding neighborhoods, clearing rubble and providing medical services, education, housing, construction, and neighborhood redevelopment. The mission of JPHRO is simple, to save lives and bring sustainable programs to the Haitian people quickly and effectively. Since the devastating earthquake has struck, JPHRO has been on the ground working to help Haitians not only to recover, but to build a better and sustainable future for themselves and for their communities. JPHRO works to make living conditions in several camps better by providing medical care, schooling, public health awareness, water, sanitation, and community programs. Its main aim and objective remains to help displaced people get back to durable, safer, and permanent homes in revitalized neighborhoods. This unique partnership with an almost entirely Haitian workforce of about 300 staff, add to which 100 volunteers, and a cash for work labor force of another eight to 900 people, and you'll get an idea of the size of this operation that he has created and directed for many months and continues to oversee. He succeeded in establishing a solid reputation of JPHRO among all stakeholders, which has brought him the admiration and the respect from fellow professional aid workers. His accomplishments speak for themselves, and I encourage you all to visit the organization's website for details, which I can unfortunately not highlight here. In sum, I cannot think of a more deserving recipient of this year's Peace Summit Award, and I'm certain that all laureates join me. On behalf of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres, in congratulating him for a truly well-deserved award. Think of it as the Oscar for your humanitarian commitment, John. <laughs> for our young audience today and over the past three days in Chicago and beyond, Sean Penn personifies a role model through his vision, his drive, not to take no for an answer from anyone, and his demonstrated commitment to make a difference that each and every one of you can also emulate each according to your own ability, each according to your own means, in your own community or elsewhere. In President Clinton's words on Monday evening, we need more people with hearts filled with fire. Sean certainly is one of them. And we wish you all the success in the continuing efforts to bring relief and hope to the half a million IDPs still displaced in Haiti today. Just before closing, and in recognition of what I just said, I'd like to announce here today that UNHCR, the agency that I work for, has just concluded a project agreement with a JPHRO over $250,000 
to combat sexual and gender-based violence or SGBV in the camps in which JPHRO works through the systematic documentation, response to and monitoring of such incidents, the provision of adequate medical treatment through the creation of additional capacities that are not yet existing and to which victims can be referred, as well as legal aid and psychosocial support services. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us in congratulating this year's Peace Summit Award recipient, Sean Pan. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a big hand. Um, thank you. It's, it's an overused phrase, I know. But I trust you'll know it's genuine today. I am humbled and trembling, and I like it. <laughs> thank you, President Gorbachev. Thank you for the very kind words and for the very generous grant, Mr. Udo Jans. Uh, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to the Nobel laureates and the Permanent Secretary of the World Summit for what is a very special honor. Thanks to Mayor Rahm Emanuel and the people of Chicago, Terry Mazzani, the Chicago Community Trust, my friend Kerry Kennedy, and the RFK Center, Olivier Francois and the Chrysler Group, and all the co-chairs and sponsors. I also must acknowledge the U.S. State Department and my friends Lieutenant General Ken Keane of the U.S. Army and former Haitian President René Preval, former U.S. Congressman Denis Kucinich, former Prime Minister of Haiti, Jean-Max Belarive, who is here today, and all my colleagues, as well as the Consul General of Haiti here, Leslie Conde. But most importantly, I want to thank my heroes, my son Hopper, and my daughter Dylan, who is here today, and of course, my mother and brother Michael. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, I, uh, I once traveled to Tanzania to visit uh, with a Maasai tribe that was off the beaten tourist track. And I remember being very moved and impressed, even delighted, that such a wholly untouched and unchanged culture could still exist, and I wished it to continue. I also remember expressing that wish to my guide, and his reply was, don't wish that for them. Any culture that remains static dies. Sometimes the truth is counterintuitive. In a globalized world, those of us who would assert our own intuition, conditioned by a luck of birth to a country of relative choice, freedom, security, comfort, and for some, even luxury, is an assertion of intuition not unlike that of a big game hunter who boasts his love of nature with the mounted heads of once proud creatures on his wall. In truth, we are often blinded, both on the right and the left, 
by our own political and monocultural romance with endless struggle. And all too often, the temporary luxury of our division and detachment allow and propagate that endless struggle to be lived out for us by vicarious assault on those less fortunate. But here's the good news. When our self-interested bickering and self-righteous dismissal of compromise among ourselves are exposed, our failure to sacred human debts, debts leave, in the case of Haiti, nine million ancestors of a singular and heroic slave rebellion on their knees in a half-life of poverty, despair, corruption, and death. But we have an out. We have an excuse. We blame Haiti. We cry corruption. We who watched Exxon post an $11 billion profit in just their first quarter last year. Never fear. These words are not intended to decry all those who work in the oil industry, nor one to put the speaker apart in consumption, but simply the acknowledgement of a stranglehold where both legal lobbying and systemic moral corruption from an industry whose poisons leak not only from tankers and rigs, but virtually paralyze the arteries of our own governments and leave us with little place to use the cries of corruption as an excuse for inaction at home or abroad. This summit in Chicago and the great expansion of Speak Truth to Power is a tribute to the belief that the Nobel laureates and the RFK Center have in young people, in students. Now, often, pundits and others will say, what do students know? What do young people know? As they will say, what does an actor know? What does a musician know? I knew there were no weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> And I bought a full-page ad in the Washington Post to print a letter to then-President Bush asking him to exercise wisdom prior to a preemptive invasion of that country, and for that I was called a traitor. <clears throat> so I'm here to say, what do we know? We know how to smell a rat. And we know that relying on the credibility of the New York Times alone proved it couldn't do the same. And we know that without our action, no president, without our action, no president, no matter how brilliant, talented, courageous, or well-intended, will ever succeed alone in pushing through health care and education policies to even civil results. We know that we are citizens. In the United States, only 25% of our fellow citizens have ever left our shores, visited another country, or have the passports to do so. Fewer and fewer have the means. I've had the great privilege to visit many countries, most recently a country and its people that I've grown to love. It would take a poet laureate to describe for you the courage and the dignity of its people. When I am asked why Haiti, why do you believe that Haiti suddenly has a chance to break the endless cycle of its own self-destructiveness and the active cycle of its exploitation by others? Well, the war for quality of life can only be fought globally. Haiti is a one and a half hour flight from Miami, the richest city and the richest country that the world has ever known. Against incredible odds, and decades of dictators, interventions, heartbreak, and even after the devastating earthquake that killed 250,000 people in 10 seconds. The Haitians rose up and democratically elected 
a president of their own choosing, President Michel Martelly. And now, as he and his prime minister-to-be, current foreign minister Laurent Lamothe, take on the enormous task of leading reconstruction in a way that will at once sidestep institutionalized political sabotage, demonstrating earned momentum for the people, and at the same time, build up the very institutions of government being sidestepped to carry on the people's will through future administrations. It's quite a task, but a doable one. With investment in agriculture, education, health care, housing with clean, clean water solutions, and recognizing it's a country of nine million people, but it's also only nine million people. Now, we have a very short window in which to support this team of the Haitian people's choosing. In these coming four years to, to, from today, they must have the support to demonstrate their vision that will improve quality of life, which at the moment is at an inhuman standard. And when I say inhuman, take a look at City Soleil sometime, where 240,000 Haitians, men, women, and children, following every light rain, sleep in a black water solution of sewage and harbor toxins, garbage and pigs, where rape and gun violence are a daily occurrence. We have four years to solidify the seating of institutions that can create sustainable democratic solutions. Four years that without a reinvigorated surge of support will leave the people's will up for grabs. Now, you may begin to wonder about the emphasis that I've put on the support of outside governments and what the international private sector may give Haiti and why I have not so emphasized how Haiti may help itself. President Martelli's got them covered on that one. He understands that the great majority of Haitians who support him have now had two years to rise from the immense trauma, the nearly biblical devastation and mourning. And he understands that there are no people on earth more willing to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. But we must understand, as Martin Luther King said, that it's fine to tell a man to pull himself up by his own bootstraps, but evil to do so to a man without boots. In these coming four years, we can provide those boots and the materials, the training, the institutional support that will allow Haiti to be again that shining symbol of independence that it began and that so many around the world have benefited from and been inspired by, you, re you may remember that it was Haiti, motivations aside, to provide the deciding vote in the establishment of the State of Israel. And also Haiti, joining in the call today for a Palestinian state, a sacred debt indeed. So, what would failure look like? And why does it matter to all of us? Well, there is the human cost of poverty. But, if, on its, but if, if that on its own is not compelling, note that the increased instability that attrition may bring to a Caribbean island an hour and a half off our shores would well be an open invitation to a new explosion of narco-trafficking, terrorist influences, and paramilitaries. This is not a polemic from a pundit, nor a politician, nor one from a bleeding heart liberal, only sympathetic to the needs outside his own country. I am a proud American citizen, an ever aspiring pacifist, who nonetheless stands by his commander-in-chief's support and leadership in the NATO mission in Libya, 
the U.S. military and central intelligence agency implementation of our commander-in-chief's action against Osama bin Laden. I've had the opportunity to travel in Pakistan just three weeks ago and see through both U.S. and Pakistani eyes the delicate balances of countries burdened by their possession of nuclear arms, suffering sectarian violence and a front row seat to the enormity of the task of governance. All great cultural revolutions depend on great international partnerships. See Presidents Mandela and de Klerk. I'd like to join the Haitian diaspora in Florida in inviting Presidents Obama and Martelli to stand side by side in these next crucial months and years for both of our countries in the world. And while I'm just one voice, I am among so many who is smelling a rat. For the young people here today, I want to tell you a quick story. And, and then I'll let everyone get on with their day. Uh, early on, after the earthquake, about four months in, President, then President Preval had called a number of us to the palace. Some, and, and we were being acknowledged for our efforts there. Um, it's a very nice ceremony. Was, I, I was always a little behind because the translation coming from French and Creole into English. But one kept me riveted. And it was a story of a police officer. I'm going to try to get through this one. He got off work at 4 o'clock. He went home, as he always did. He saw his family. He kissed his children. He went upstairs to change out of his uniform and take a shower. He did. He hung his uniform on the hook by the shower upstairs. And he came downstairs, smiled at the family. They knew where he was going. He was going to have that one cigarette. And he stepped outside, and the earth shook. And he turned to the two-story house behind him, and it was below his knees level, all of it. And he dove into it to grab his family. And all he got was his uni uniform from the top floor. And he put it on. And he went to work. And he guided the emergency traffic and was credited with saving hundreds of lives. So what can we do? What can you do? Help guide the traffic with any means you have necessary. Help guide the traffic in a dinner conversation. Help guide the traffic to peace. I am honored to be among so many in this room and at this summit. Honored that my friend, President Clinton, who has been such a great champion of Haiti, opened this summit two days ago. And honored to accept this award, award on behalf of the Haitian people and all of those who on January 12, 2010, were lost. Be they Haitian nationals, UN staff, NGO workers, or any in their families. And those whose memory was lost under the rubble that it is our job to remove and revive. And finally, to all of those willing to do whatever it takes to make tomorrow just a little bit better. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Olivier Francois, Chief Marketing Officer, Chrysler Group LLC, and Fiat Group Automobile President and Chief Executive Officer, Fiat Brand Worldwide. Wow, what can I add after those words? So much emotion, so I'm going to be very quick and Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm obviously humble and proud to be here with you today. But uh, as I look around this room, I also 
feel remarkably at home. It has been my privilege to meet and get to know many of you uh, during the past three editions of the summit in Paris, Berlin, and Hiroshima. Fiat Chrysler already was a sponsor of those summits. Our European brand, Lancia, as part of its involvement, decided to join hands with the laureates in a campaign to win the release of Mrs. Aung San Suu Kyi. And our... And our whole company was overwhelmed with joy and uh, even a certain feeling of pride as Mrs. Suu Kyi was finally, finally released from prison, ironically, as we were gathered uh, in Hiroshima during the 2010 Laureate Summit. But uh, if I keep uh, looking around, I see another friend, Mr. Sean Penn. Sean is, before all, a friend of Haiti. And through our Jeep brand uh, on the American side of the group, we decided two years ago uh, to donate vehicles for transportation of the staff and delivery of goods. And this is how the Fiat Chrysler Group became involved with Schoen and the JPHRO. And now, today, everything, everything seems to come together, I'd almost say magically, as the Nobel laureates honor Schoen Pen with the 2012 Peace Summit Award. So let me ask you, is this just more proof that it's a small world? Is it just a happy coincidence? I believe it's neither. What is really uh, represent is a story about shared values. Values are what bind a family together, right? And shared values are what have brought us together at the summit. Values such as mutual respect, a recognition of basic rights, a thirst of justice, compassion for those who suffer, a commitment to the non-violent resolution of conflicts. Now, you may wonder, why would Fiat and Chrysler support these values? Why would they believe it is part of their mission to help the Nobel Peace Laureates, Sean Penn, and others to create a better world? Is it just a marketing strategy to sell cars? No. Our reasons go deeper. But yes, they do square with solid business thinking. The French philosopher Albert Camus wrote, to be born, to create, to love, to win at games, is to be born to live in a time of peace. But war teaches us to lose everything and become what we are not. It is common sense that happy people are more likely to buy, as an example, a car. It may be true that money can't buy you love or happiness, but a certain level of prosperity is still part of attaining a sense of well-being. And in my opinion, peace together with freedom is the glue that holds happiness and prosperity together. You know, the lives of our corporations are traditionally based on long-term business plans. So let me ask you, why wouldn't peace become part of the long-term business plan? And why wouldn't some of the company's resources also be invested in supporting those people who strive for these goals? During the three days of this conference, we have heard that the cause of advancing peace is a responsibility that does not just fall on governments. The quest for peace has no finish line, and each of us must work for the cause in our own way. For our part, we are humbled uh, to support today the work of men and women who have shaped our modern history and who for two years have worked so hard to write the very first charter for a world without violence. At Fiat and Chrysler, we have decided to invest and support peace, to invest in supporting this charter. And with the assistance of the Nobel laureates, we have again this year put together a video 
which primary purpose is to spread the message and share hope uh, for the future. Thank you. There's a name for war and killing. There's a name for giving in when you know another answer. For me, the name is sin. But there's still time to turn around and make all hatred cease and give another name to living, and we could call it peace. And peace would be the road we walk each step along the way. And peace would be the way we work, and peace the way we play. And in all we see that's different, and in all the things we know, peace would be the way we look, and peace the way we grow. There's a name for separation. There's a name for first and last. When it's all for us or nothing, for me, the name is past. But there's still time to turn around and make all hatred cease and give a name to all the future, and we could call it peace. And if peace is what we pray for and peace is what we give, then peace will be the way we are and peace the way we live. Yes, there's still time to turn around and make all hatred cease and give another name to living, and we could call it peace. <laughs>